three regular top of the polls. Sir. What do you think about this election business? Very good. Great, isn't it? Yeah. Good stuff, this election stuff. All right, if you win. Do you think it's harder being a politician than being a pop star? Yes, definitely. Probably. Yes. Very much so. I've never been a politician, though. What would happen if you got all this? Never been. Don't take our money, Harold. And I... <laughs>
my arm. Well, that's something else if you don't get a move on. Here he is, Sarge. I just caught him trying to catch the first bus out of the dock garage, so I uh, just got on and told the driver to come straight here. You came with bus? Well, why not? Come on, inside you. Another villain captured. But not all crimes are solved that easily. Usually it takes painstaking research, legwork, and hours of tedious questioning. Take the curious case of the prowler with ten faces. A phone call to the yard, and a sturdy bunch of men are on the case. This is Fabian of Scotland Yard. Hello, Winters. What's the trouble? Interpol have been on the line from France, Sir Andrew. There was another of those murders in Marseille last night, exactly the same as the others. What the devil are the French police doing? Same. Oui. Who is it this time? I've seen her before, Inspector. She dances at La Poupée. Bravo 1, B Bravo 1. C21, Bolster Avenue, Chelsea. Reported attack by a prowler. B Bravo 1, Miss Rossi. Okay, okay. Wingate Avenue, repeat. Wingate Avenue. East to Hetterton Avenue, repeat. Hetterton Avenue. Is that what you want to be, D? Devic, one report your position, please. We're stuck in a traffic jam, love. We'd like to be here for half an hour or so. Report your position. We're going north, lover, along the Golden Mile. Anything in on the prowler? I see. Well, let me know if something comes through, will you? Our cross-filing system gives us a lead to three million names, aliases and faces that can be identified from methods of crime and physical characteristics. Here, yeah, this is the fellow. His name slipped my mind. But there's nothing to tie him up with Redmond, show that they knew each other. Uh -huh. Yes, there is. Prowler reported on Somerset Street, SW3, investigating. Put out an old cars message. All cars in Chelsea Cordon deploy as follows. D, Delta 1, proceed south side of Winfield Square. F, Foxtrot 1, proceed north corner Thornton Mews. Dead Victor 1, we'll go. The villain eluded them. Scotland Yard's radio room put us on his trail again. Oh, Mr. Renfield. Who are you? May I see your passport, please, sir? Don't I show it in there? Yes, but they're anxious to get you on the plane. It's just taking off. Oh, I see. Yes, of course. That's as good a way as any of getting a man's gun. Yes, Redman. Now you're going to go back where you came from. But for many years longer. Come on. So finally, the prowler is apprehended. Well, that's all from me, so uh, keep them peeled. Evening, George. Oh, good evening, all. Good evening, all. It's just a little hard to imagine P.C. Dixon reading the Doc Green Sun with a story the government didn't like. But times have changed, and that's really happened to me. There's nothing new about restrictions in broadcasting. They began even before Dixon hit his beat. In 1950, chairman of the BBC governors, Lord Simon, banned a repeat of a play called Party Manners. Did he think a repeat might bore viewers? No. 
the play showed Labour in a bad light, and it just so happened that Lord Simon was a Labour Party peer. 1955, Postmaster General Dr Charles Hill decided it wasn't safe for TV to be talking about anything that Parliament might be discussing in the next couple of weeks. The very idea is now almost impossible to believe. Imagine banning financial information from the news for two weeks before the budget. I can't, but it really did happen. 1963, independent television was now mature. But the Independent Television Authority was another matter. Along came that great, long-running series, World in Action. And out went one of their very first programs. This extract from that never-before-seen-on-TV program shows how World in Action tried graphically to bring home to viewers the second-by-second -second levels of defense spending incurred even then. This is the time to have the time of your life, eating time for the big time prizes. This after Big Ben is probably the most familiar clock in Britain, the clock that ticks out the big money prizes on Sundays at the Palladium. Tonight we use this clock to signal its biggest money ever, money paid by the taxpayers. Tonight, every full circle sweep of the hand takes exactly a second, and every flashing light stands for one pound. Sixty pounds a second, every second. And that's the speed at which Britain is this year spending money on defence. 60 pounds a second, 3,600 pounds a minute, 216,000 pounds an hour, 5,180,000 pounds a day, 1,838 million pounds in the year. Three years later, one of the most powerful, politically challenging films of the post-war era was banned from TV screens for almost a quarter century. Peter Watkins' film, The War Game, a dramatic and chilling portrayal of what a nuclear attack on Britain would really mean, was shelved after secret official pressure. Rochester in Kent. Now two square miles of fire, resulting from the heat of a thermonuclear missile which has exploded off course on its path to London Airport. This is the phenomenon which could perhaps happen in Britain following a nuclear strike against certain of our cities. This happened after the bombing of Hamburg, at Dresden, at Tokyo, and at Hiroshima. This is what is technically known as a firestorm. Within its center, the rising heat from multiple fires caused by both the heat flash and the blast wave upsetting stoves and open furnaces is sucking in ground-level winds at speeds exceeding a hundred miles an hour. This is the wind of a firestorm. The 1970s. Politically, we'd grown up a bit and even political satire had become respectable. It was drama now. And yes, sex, that was the new target. Never mind the playwright, spot the saucy bits. Out went Dennis Potter and Brimstone and Treacle. The man in charge of the Beeb had found it repugnant. Out went the original TV screenplay of Scum by Roy Minton. Out with Howard Barker. Out with Howard Schumann and his censored scenes from King Kong. Well, Howard is still censored, and what King Kong did, and with whom, I must leave entirely to your imagination. The 1980s. Secrecy, security, and surveillance started to hit the blank screen. For the second time in ten years, the IBA banned World in Action from showing film about GCHQ Cheltenham, the giant electronic spy agency. 1987. This time, the target was me. I'd made six programs in the Secret Society series for BBC Two, and some of the BBC governors had started to get a little bit twitchy. In January 1987, Director General Alistair Milne acceded to government hints and banned the now world-famous Zircon spy satellite revelation. My home was raided, my magazine office occupied for five days, and finally the special branch moved in on BBC Scotland to clear out every last remaining inch of film, tape and video to do with any of the programmes in the series. Alistair Milne himself was peremptorily sacked. Then the Zircon secret got out. 
What difference to the situation for Britain and NATO will be made by the Zircon satellite? I can't talk to you about that, I'm afraid. You're saying that everything about Zircon is, is, yeah. is classified? Yes, I'm sorry about that. One other secret society program remains banned. This is Cabinet, which explains, amongst other things, how the government planned a propaganda war against the peace movement before the 1983 general election. The newest restrictions on broadcasting are also some of the oldest, on Ireland. In 1959, all but one of the series on the six counties by Alan Wicker were ditched. Since then, the government has learned nothing. The rows over Ireland are seemingly unending. Two editions of World in Action Lost, along with Marshall Rofel's A Sense of Loss and Kenneth Griffith's study of 1920s IRA leader Michael Collins. In 1985, Real Life's Edge of the Union, and in 1988, Death on the Rock became as great co celeb as Secret Society. Then, in October 1988, came Home Secretary Hurd's broadcasting ban. One of the hunger strikers, Ray McCartney, was allowed to make a statement to Granada Television. Art is for restricted and also for ridiculous.
Thank you.